This past summer, Entergy, the energy conglomerate that owns the Vermont Yankee nuclear power plant, announced that due to both an increase in cost trajectory, as well as decreasing funds from regional market assistance programs, the plant, which accounts for over 70% of Vermont's total electricity production, will enter a rapid decommissioning phase, resulting in the plant's ultimate closure by the end of 2014. The announcement sent both Vermont energy regulatory officials and private Vermont utility providers into a frantic scramble to establish new energy net production networks capable of sustaining both current and future energy demand, while simultaneously ensuring a stable market price ceiling for the state's electricity consumers. As Vermont attempts to reconfigure its current nuclear and import-dependent energy portfolio towards a self-sustainable model, renewable energy advocates and utility providers have turned to the policy framework of Title 30, Section 248, a Vermont statute for the permitting and regulation of new gas and electric facilities, which provides a regulatory outlet free from the stringent oversight of Act 250, the state's chief land use and development policy. Essentially, by granting a quasi-judicial public service board with the exclusive control over the licensing of utility development permits, Section 248 allows renewable energy projects to bypass Act 250 land development restrictions which have garnered an infamous reputation for stymieing innovation and economic development in the state. Renewable energy advocates tend to view Section 248 as the saving grace of alternative energy in Vermont, as it provides a streamlined policy avenue towards building a stable and clean energy future in response to the production void left by the decommissioning of Vermont Yankee. However, some Vermonters have criticized the statute for failing to take local stakeholders' views into proper consideration before granting utility development permits. The case of Kingdom Community Wind, a recently implemented grid-scale wind farm in Lowell, Vermont, illustrates this contention between local stakeholders and renewable energy developers in the Section 248 permitting process. The project has brought once latent community concerns regarding land use and energy development to the center of the policy stage, leading to a contentious battle in the relatively unchartered domain of renewable energy regulation in Vermont. In many ways, the permitting process and ultimate outcomes of Kingdom Community Win case are indicative of the state's renewable energy regulatory trajectory as Vermont moves towards a cleaner and more self-sustainable future energy portfolio. Um, we really rarely had uh, energy permitted in Vermont, and that's because um, we had typically, with the exception of some uh, hydroelectric facilities, uh, we typically have gotten all of our electricity externally, plus Vermont, Vermont Yankee, Yankee in the South. Mm -hmm. And Vermont Yankee, um, so, you know, Vermont Yankee, and then we've got some dams on the Connecticut River. We've got some dams around that. We've gotten some local hydro. Aside from that, um, until recently, we really haven't developed uh, renewable energy in the state. Mm -hmm. So it was somewhat untested. So some of the angst that, that you'll hear from folks who were involved um, in Kingdom Wind uh, you know, comes in part fr from the fact that that the the uh, the way the system has been set up hadn't taken into account um, the that we would have these local cases these more localized cases. Mm -hmm. you know, you we identified Green Mountain Power, the Agency of Natural Resources, and the public as the three main interest groups involved in the Kingdom Wind permitting process. Each of these groups had an impact on the Public Service Board's permitting of Kingdom Wind. Our project attempted to discern the extent of each group's impact and to what degree they were considered in the Public Service Board's review. Green Mountain Power is Vermont's electricity utility providing energy to over 80% of Vermont homeowners and businesses. They are the energy entity that first brought the project to the table, developed Kingdom Wind, and continue to operate it today. Green Mountain Power works closely with the state to keep energy costs down while simultaneously advancing toward meeting Vermont's renewable energy goals. We spoke with Dorothy Schnorr at Green Mountain Power headquarters in Colchester, Vermont to talk about the steps they had to take in the permitting of Kingdom Wind. I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, first of all, to build wind in Vermont, I mean, there's, it's, it's a long development process. We worked for several years um, developing information, doing studies before we even applied to the Public Service Board. Mm -hmm. And then it's a one-year, very intensive process that the Public Service Board goes through 
before they issue approval or denial of that. Um, and that's a process that involves experts from all areas. Um, people opposed are involved. So it's a very robust, very thorough, probably more robust than any other state I'm aware of yeah. in terms of what it analyzes and in terms of public participation. Um, it's really, um, people have a voice in this process, a, a very clear voice. And the Public Service Board, I think, really goes out of its way to make sure that it listens to the public and people that may not be represented by a lawyer, I, they recognize that and they, I think, go out of their way to make sure that they hear what those people have to say. And then they have experts coming in, testifying on both sides, and they need to evaluate who has a more compelling argument, who, mm -hmm. who, who seems to be presenting information that really makes the most sense. Yeah, it seems like the whole thing is very and, responsive. And then when it issues its permit, we had, I think, I think it's like something like 65 requirements of things that we needed to do, requirements that we needed to meet. They don't just say, go build it. Mm -hmm. They say, build it, but you must do this, must do this. I mean, the sound monitoring. We had, mm -hmm. you know, nine periods where we had to, to monitor sound continuously for two weeks, for nine different periods over two years. The Agency of Natural Resources is the state agency tasked with the protection and responsible use of Vermont's natural resources. In the case of Kingdom Wind, this meant ensuring that development of the Lowell Mountain Ridgeline did not cause adverse undue harm to the environment. The Agency of Natural Resources conducted a full-scale environmental impact report on which the Public Service Board relied heavily during their review process. We had the opportunity to meet with Deb Markowitz, the secretary of the agency, to discuss the Agency of Natural Resources' relationship with the Public Service Board and their involvement with the permitting process. It's for the first time ever, the Public Service Board is seeing uh, these cases. And just to give you an idea, um, in 2007, there were only two major energy cases in front of the Public Service Board. This, in 2010, the last year we've got like the complete numbers, there were 33, but then there were 200 other small cases. For every way we, we create energy, there is an environmental impact. And so we've never had to take responsibility for it. And so what's happening now, now that we've got this commitment to putting renewable energy in Vermont, is that for the first time we have to face those environmental consequences. And the conversation that's happening right now, Kin Kingdom Wind is a great example, is what can we tolerate? What's too much impact? Mm -hmm. And, and um, what the standard is, is that um, will the question that we ask and what's asked by the Public Service Board is, will this development have an undue adverse impact on the natural resources? The impact of the public on the Public Service Board's permitting process is arguably the most important, yet hardest to understand and measure. Because citizen groups are much more varied and diffuse than the other two interest groups, we tried to look holistically at the degree to which citizens have a say in the permitting process and the avenues they have to express their support or concerns. We identified a variety of citizen groups, both for and against the Kingdom Wind Project, and looked at their interactions with Green Mountain Power, the Agency of Natural Resources, and the Public Service Board itself. One such citizen interest group the Lowell Mountain Group, which has strongly opposed Kingdom Wind, is run by Annette Smith, who offered her thoughts on the permitting process for our project. It's something that I'm, I'm very sad about. You know, don't shoot the messenger. I'm sorry. I thought wind was going to be part of the solution. I was in favor of wind in 2003. I spoke in public about it. I didn't know. But when you work on the wind issue and you go into these communities, it's like a terrorist has landed in your community because it is something that if you are, if everything that you own, everything you've ever believed in, you've invested in your home and your property, and you're threatened with the possibility that you might not be able to live there anymore. And we now have hundreds of people in this position, and by January we're going to have more than a thousand people around these three mountains, and it's not going to be everyone. We can't predict in advance who it's going to be, but the noise experts tell me that especially the Lowell Project is going to be very, very uh, uh, noisy.
While the Agency of Natural Resources and Green Mountain Power filed separate environmental impact reports to the Public Service Board, there is undoubtedly a bureaucratic union between the two groups that gave their claims elevated standing in front of the board. For one, Green Mountain Power understood that without the support of the Agency of Natural Resources, their project likely would not get approved. Simultaneously, the Agency of Natural Resources had an incentive to favor Green Mountain Power's project proposal because of the utility provider's in-state market position and previously demonstrated credibility for environmental stewardship. There is broad support for wind energy across Vermont, and most public opinion polls indicate that Vermonters are enthusiastic about increasing opportunities to provide energy from renewable resources to homes and businesses across the state. However, a number of objections arise from concerned citizens when the implementation of wind power projects affects their communities. The Kingdom Community Wind Project raised two major concerns, the health of the environment and the well-being of local residents, on the basis of which various groups attempted to prevent the construction of the wind farm. Locals who object to the presence of unsightly turbines on Lowell Mountain and the damage caused to local public space are upset with the reduction of standards that resulted from Section 248. Annette Smith argues that the Public Service Board is focused on expanding renewable energy, and Section 248 allows the Board to ignore previously relevant environmental concerns. Quote, The value of Vermont's ecosystems, forests, and mountain habitats for addressing climate change have not been quantified or taken into consideration. Whether Vermont's ecosystems or fossil fuel reductions are more effective at fighting global warming, Section 248 has certainly reduced the ability of public interest groups to lobby the Public Service Board for environmental protection. Major complaints were also raised relating to the health and well-being of local residents. Concerns focused on disturbing noise levels, reduced property values, and property damage from the building efforts. Yet these objections were not shared by all Lowell residents, a significant majority of whom voted at a town meeting to support the project. This local support was a key factor in Green Mountain Power's case to the Public Service Board. The Public Service Board's review is a formal process, however, which focuses on whether or not to approve the project, rather than how best to address citizens' interests. This formality is a barrier to public interest groups, which do not have the cohesion or resources of an organization like Green Mountain Power necessary for making a clear case to the Public Service Board. Instead, the Lowell Mountain Group and other associations are limited to litigating once the decision has already been reached. Green Mountain Power needed to adhere to legal guidelines and gain public approval for the Kingdom Community Wind Project. To this end, Green Mountain Power made significant efforts to offset the environmental, ecological, and economic costs of the development. In order to reduce the direct footprint on the Lowell Mountain area, Green Mountain Power used new smaller turbine platforms and ensured that all roads built to access the area would regenerate. Beyond the Lowell Mountain region, the company set aside 2,800 acres of land for conservation in order to offset the impact on Vermont's environment. But local citizens were more concerned about the impact of a nearby wind farm on their day-to-day -day lives. Green Mountain Power argued that there is no evidence that the presence of wind turbines reduces property values and engaged in a door-to-door -door campaign in the Lowell area to answer citizens' questions about the Kingdom Community Wind Proposal and wind energy in general. To address the most common concern, noise levels, they bussed townspeople to a wind farm in New Hampshire so that they could experience the decibel levels as sounds and not simply numbers. Wind farms in Vermont are required to adhere to a 45 decibel maximum and the Kingdom Community Wind has complied with this law. Green Mountain Power makes the case that this level of noise does not disturb local citizens. We need to make sure that the sound from the turbines does not exceed 45 decibels outside someone's house. Inside their house it needs to be 30 decibels. Um, so we'll wait and let this get down to 45 decibels and that's the loudest it can be outside someone's home and we are meeting that standard. can't quite get there. <laughs> so with the air handling system, the clock ticking the seconds, and someone talking way down the hall, 
is exceeds the standard that we have to have outside someone's house. Wow. And I don't think people understand that. Um, it's fascinating. One of the people that complains frequently, he'll be quoting the paper saying, it was, I measured 46 decibels outside my house. This is terrible. Nobody should have to live like this. And I say to every reporter, download this free app. Yeah. Listen to 45 decibels, and then, which it's not 45 decibels because we measure it. Outside his home, sometimes it's for, well, when we measured it, um, it's above 45 decibels for many, many hours due to natural sounds, but not the turbines. Increasing attempts by out-of-state energy producers to sell the electricity made from Vermont's wind back to out-of-state regional grids have generally been met by strong contestation from both the Public Service Board as well as the Agency of Natural Resources. Unlike out-of-state competitors, Green Mountain Power's credibility as an in-state utility provider, in conjunction with their attentiveness to the Agency of Natural Resources land degradation concerns, was a key contributor to their favorable Public Service Board permitting opinion. This outcome has the potential to serve as a precedent for future public service board petitions, in the sense that in-state utility providers will have an advantage in the renewable energy permitting process.